Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast, formerly Amanda's Wellbeing podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food facts series. I am Amanda Hayes, your host, a lawyer turned nutritionist with a deep curiosity about living an active, healthy and fulfilling life, which I would call a vibrant life and sharing with you what I learn on this podcast. I will note that, although I will often be speaking with experts, any advice or information provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to be used to treat, cure or prevent injuries or medical conditions, and it is never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. I'm very happy to welcome back Lara Casanova, whom we met in July 2019. Lara is a yoga teacher, life coach and professional counsellor specialising in grief and loss. In our previous episode, Lara and I discussed her book Grief, Grace and Gratitude, which was about both her personal journey through the grief after her father's death and how to cope with grief and ultimately transform your life. Today, Lara and I continue on the theme of grief And we address a much underrated type of grief, that is pet grief. Hi, Lara. Welcome back to my podcast. It's great to have you on as a guest again. So today we're continuing with the theme of grief, on which Lara is an expert. We'll be discussing Lara's most recent book, uh, her third book, Loss, Love and Lessons, which is all about healing from pet grief. And Lara, I do have a confession to make. When I was reading your book, I cried a lot because I love my dog, Lenny, my Airedale Terrier, so much that the thought of him dying just fills me with dread and sadness. But anyway, it's a reality that we're, well, I'm going to have to face. So in your book, Lara, you say pet loss is a form of disenfranchised grief that is not recognized by our society. So I'd like to delve into that and ponder that for a moment. Why do you think pet grief is not fully recognised by society? Um, First, I just wanted to say welcome and thank you. And yes, I get the crying before (laughs) the dog even dies. I've had that a lot. That's anticipatory grief and we Mm -hmm. love them so much. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, So disenfranchised grief refers to any grief that's not recognised or acknowledged by society and it's often minimised and misunderstood. And I think that um, it's not fully recognised because animals for many years were sort of kept outside. It was like the barn cats Mm. or the working dogs and it's only in more recent years that we refer to them as fur children. We let them sleep on our beds and dress them up in pretty bows and have them, you know, with Christmas presents. So we didn't acknowledge them for a long time. And that human animal bond has grown so much in the last, you know, 15,000 years. For many um, years, we didn't even give them pain relief to pets, which is horrendous. Yeah. So, and bearing in mind, some people have had poor experience with pets. Um, So I think that the main reason is that not a lot of value is placed on pets in society as much as humans. Mm -hmm. It's changed over the years and it continues to change, but that's often. And people just say, it's just a dog, it's just a cat, easily replaced, get another one. And they don't realize that those comments can be quite hurtful, even unintended to be. So I think it's that value and it is changing, but it was still going to take time to change even more. Yeah, I think people who are listening to us discuss this today who have a pet will really relate to that. Yeah. I mean, it, they are a part of the family. Yeah. Mm, so yeah. it's good that it's changing. And what can pets teach us about love, Lara? Um, oh, they can teach us so much stuff. They just give us this absolutely unconditional love. You know, they're loyal to the core, they're faithful, they're sitting at the front door if you're out for three hours just waiting. And I think they teach us how to love with no judgment and to love in the moment and live in the moment and, you know, running to the door to greet the loved ones with so much enthusiasm and excitement and they don't hold grudges and they're just so present 
in the moment. Yes. And, and, and that's where you can find the love when you're actually present in the moment. You know, you're just living life. So just how to live with an open heart, I suppose. Yeah, that's gorgeous. They they are, they do just live in the moment, which humans spend years trying to learn how to do. <laughs> yes, a lifetime. And I've yeah. spent the last 20 years like trying to stop living in the past and stop ruminating about the future mm. and just coming back to this present moment and sinking down into the heart where kind of life is lived. Exactly. And I'm 53 and I'm still learning every day. You know, yeah, me, me too. It is hard, yeah. isn't it? Anyway, it's good that we have pets around to help us. Yes, yes, that. and mirror some of those lessons back to us to learn. So, Lara, your previous book, uh, Grief, Grace and Gratitude, was written in response to the death of your beloved father. Yes. And you learned a lot through that grieving process and um, you wrote the book to help others with their journey through grief. So what inspired you to write your current book about pet grief? Well, Maxie, my beautiful golden retriever, um, inspired me, as did my dad, to write Grief, Grace and Gratitude. So all my books come from a personal experience of mine and I use that as a backdrop in the book mm -hmm. and I share my experiences so others can learn from that because we don't feel so alone when we read other people's experiences. So Max or Maxie or my main man, <laughs> I had many nicknames. Um, yeah, he was my inspiration. He was my first dog of mine, not a family. Yep. And he saw me through various different situations in my life so he's my inspiration how do you think grieving for a pet and a human is different or are they different yeah that's a really good question because i think that they are very similar or very different mm. and i think it's because every grief event is just different and individual depending on what's happening in your life or the bond with who's passed away or what you're holding on to from past life events so for example when I lost Max I had not addressed a whole lot of other grief events going back probably 20 years right so when I lost Max and the grief hit, it's like, oh, my God, not just his grief, but the grief of mum and mm. dad breaking up, the grief of me breaking up with a partner, various other things all came to be dealt with. So it was overwhelming. It was lengthy. It was complex. Yet when my dad died, it was easier because I'd addressed all that unaddressed. Right grief and I just had his grief to deal with and I, I called it to myself more of a clean grief I mm -hmm. could just sit with the sadness and process it so for me it was harder potentially or more complex when I lost my dog but it didn't mean I didn't grieve as hard for dad it was just mm. a little bit easier so it depends what's going on in your life yeah that makes sense and also I guess when you lost your dad you experienced you know you'll get through it well, so. and yes, from having lost my dog it, and, and going through what was really difficult for me and getting to the other end and feeling like I'd processed it. Yes, I knew when dad died, oh, here I am again. I know what I need to go through mm -hmm. and I just have to let the grief take over and run its course and I know I'll get to the other end at some point. You said when Max died, some other um, issues came up for you. Do you think you didn't address them in the past because you were just it was you were too busy or you didn't have the mental space or because um, I know that that happens a lot with people mm. they don't necessarily address their grief well it can so. be very overwhelming and mm. very scary so I think what we do and especially and me too is oh I feel a feeling coming up oh, I'm gonna go and work harder eat some more chocolate smoke some cigarettes yeah. oh maybe turn to drugs or or whatever it might be just to avoid and suppress those feelings from coming up we're so frightened of of them and you know it, they can be scary I've suffered anxiety and I've suffered depression back in my late 20s for a period of time and it's it's debilitating yeah and um but what I realized is if you walk through it and through the pain it's actually that's the worst it can get it's just allowing those feelings to rise mm. to cry as much as you need to cry yell and hit a pillow without <laughs> expressing your anger whatever as long as you're not hurting yourself or anyone else and feeling that anxiety and then because you can't the more you suppress the the so-called bad emotions mm. well we call them bad they're not bad they're just emotions yeah we suppress the good ones too and then we get all confused and mixed up and we don't want to we don't want to deal with anything yeah at, at your you're saying it's easier just to kind of sweep it aside and yeah well we yeah. think it is we think it is but but the long-term 
complications of that can be more depression, more anxiety, post-traumatic stress, yeah. more grief, just not living a full and rich life. You know, this one mm. life we get that's so precious. Exactly, exactly. If people read your book then, um, before we delve into how you've structured it, yep. what do you hope that they will learn from it? Yeah. When I wrote it, my mission, which is alongside Katrina Warren, who is the celebrity vet um, mm-hmm. from the Wonder Dog team. She used to have Toby the Wonder Dog. She's got a similar mission and she wrote the forward for me, which was amazing. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. she was. she's so lovely and she's just lost Riley, her golden retriever, which is quite you know coincidental that my book is just being launched about my golden retriever. But my mission alongside hers is to heal and transform others through their grief so you can get to the other side and feel happy and whole again and then be ready to open your heart and your home again to another fur child because when I was working in the vet clinic and I still hear it when I talk yep. to people in the park I can't get another dog or can't get another cat it hurt too much I'm never going through that again and maybe is that because we haven't dealt with that grief fully to come out the other side and You know, our dogs bring us so much love and to me all that love is worth all those tears and um, just being able to open ourselves up to that potential hurt. If we know we can get through it, getting another dog, we know we'll get through it. So helping people to to be able to to do that. And there might be a little bit of fear attached to getting another pet because you might think, oh, what if I don't love it as much as the other one? Or what if it's not that the personality is so different and dogs are just so great that that probably isn't an issue. I don't (laughs) know. And I think it's if if the time's right, because sometimes we lose a dog and we think, oh, I need to go out and get another one tomorrow. And that's when some of those feelings may come up because we're thinking we're replacing one and we may not be ready. Sometimes Mm. we need to listen to our heart and know when we're ready for that other dog and we're maybe a little bit more healed to be able to just know that it's a new dog it's a new life it's a new experience and I'm going to offer this one just as much love without getting caught in um, confusing emotion so that yeah. may be why it's a good point and also the other thing to remember is I know we're talking mainly about dogs but it is a big commitment when you have a puppy <laughs> you know you've got there's a lot of work to be done I have a 14 month <laughs> old puppy and she has sent me to the brink of my emotions and and back again and I've read this on Labrador pages on the Facebook and Golden Retriever you know I was having renovations during COVID and I was outside once crying going I can't cope being stuck at home all day every day with a you know a five-month-old puppy and two other dogs and (laughs) and renovations and COVID you know there was a lot going on but but they're worth it you know now she's 15 months she walks nicely on a lead but I've done lots of training and invested a lot of time and that's what we need to do with puppies to give them the best chance so they're not surrendered at two years old because they're uncontrollable yeah, you know but yeah. they are like a baby a human baby they are hard work they are hard work that is no. definitely true but as you say worth Good, it beautiful loving hard work <laughs> So let's talk about your book and how you've structured it. You've divided it into three parts. So perhaps you could just tell us what those three parts are and what they're broadly about. Um, So I've done this with all my books, actually. They've all got three parts. Um, The first part is the loss. So Maxi shares the loss from he talks about his life in his voice, which I've heard from most people is one of the most beautiful parts of the book. Yes. Um, Yeah. Um, and then um, I share from my voice. So it's kind of for, for the audience to tap into how I felt, how Max felt, and then align their stories. And then part two is the love. That details more the strategies and the theories and the processes and the tools and how to do a memorial and mm-hmm. rituals and things like that to help us get through it. And part three, the lessons. That discusses all the beautiful lessons that our dogs teach us or mirror back to us about how we may be able to live a better life because of what they teach us. Excellent. Yeah. So if we start with the loss, uh, as you said, you've written part of it from the point of view of Max. Yeah. So tell us about Max. Oh, he was a character. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know much about bringing up a dog when I got him, so he was a bit chaotic. <laughs> but looking back, but he just matured into this beautiful old man and he was a golden golden retriever not a white one so he when he was old he had what looked like sunglass marks around his eyes (laughs) 
and he was the, he was strong and determined and you know once we were at a park and this shady character came up with you know pants hanging around almost near his ankles it was a bit weird <laughs> and maxie positioned himself in between this this character and me and just faced him and bucked his head off at him i'm like okay we need to get and I said yeah you better watch out for my dog he's a bit scary it's like a golden (laughs) retriever anyway we quickly scooted away from that park isn't that interesting that protective instinct yeah very protective they are and that's what he was like and you know he was someone a dog that wanted to be with you all the time if there was a dog door and it was closed he would destroy it somehow and get in (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to be inside where the people were because that golden retrievers especially they don't want to be outside they want yeah. to be where the people are yeah but lenny and my dog follows yeah. me around when i'm at home he's just within two inches of my <laughs> my ankles and then you turn around and nearly trip over him yeah yeah <laughs> he's underfoot <laughs> lara what is the typical life expectancy of a dog and a cat um it can vary quite enormously, but they say like a dog, like a golden retriever, so medium to large breed is about 10 to 12 years mm-hmm. on average, but Max is one week shy of 15. My current golden retriever, Susie, is 14, and I've just put to sleep only about 12 weeks ago a little black lab called Chelsea that I adopted when she was 11, and she was nearly 17. So, you know, very small dogs can live a little longer. I saw a little 18-year-old trot out of the vet the other day with all this confidence and bravado. He looked so wise with his little grey muzzle. 18. And then bigger dogs, obviously, like wolfhounds, maybe a bit younger, seven or eight. Mm. And then cats also average 10 to 15, but I've seen some live till 20. And I think some is the way they're brought up. I think some is their genetics. Um and their previous health issues. So there's a sure. lot of factors to consider, but I expect to get, yeah, 15 years out of mine. Right. Will not mm. get 15 years, then be around yeah. with me for 15. A bit of a um, practical question because I haven't dealt with this personally yet. What happens to a pet when they die? What I mean, in terms of their body, what physically yeah. happens to their body? Okay, so... Where I used to work at a large vet clinic in Adelaide, um, Australia, um, they the Animal Welfare League would do the cremation. Mm-hmm. So they would come and pick the body up from the vet clinic and they would take it back to their facility and they would cremate it. And you had a few options to get the pet back in a really nice urn um, or, or alternatively like a plastic container. That's mm-hmm. quite an expensive option to have the nice urn or you don't get their ashes back and they shed or spread some of those ashes in the rose garden okay. down at Animal Welfare League. Mm-hmm. But then I found out there are a couple of other cr- pet cremation places in Adelaide and then there's also a pet cemetery in Wallaroo, which I didn't even oh, okay. know about. Is Maybe it haunted? It was... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There were two, I think, because I did a bit of research, or maybe it was you who mentioned it. I think there was a couple, but one had shut down. But, you know, like a human cemetery, I didn't even know about them. And I have both Maxie and Chelsea in a beautiful urn next to my bed, you know, on the the big side table. Right. I learnt many things through reading your book, but one thing you talked about that I hadn't heard of before was the Rainbow Bridge. Ah. But then when I started looking online, I thought, oh, it's actually quite a well-known yeah. term. So can you tell us what that means? Well, uh, yeah, I can. Now, Mum and I joke that every time we start talking about Rainbow Bridge, we both break down Oh, no. <laughs> I won't break down into I'll try not to. But that's more. There's a poem about Rainbow Bridge, and it's just beautiful. If you haven't read it, Google it. It's very, very touching. I've read poem. it. Mm. Yes, and I can't get past the first line without getting a bit teary so it's rainbow bridge is like a mythical place that the dogs go when they pass away it's lots of green meadows they can run around the health is restored Uh, if they had any um, illnesses and injuries they're all restored and they're just there's food and water and sunshine and they play with all the other animals and then one day when we no longer are here we meet and and up with them again and then we cross over the rainbow bridge together to wherever that may be so for me it's kind of just soothes my heart to think Mm. they're living on they're all playing up there together over there up there whatever and then one day 
will be together again and they live on in my heart and all those paw prints that are yes. scattered over my heart. So it's what I like to think. Yeah, that's really lovely actually, isn't it? Because it does conjure up images of your pet being yeah. happy and healthy and, yeah. you know, having the best pet life yeah. possible. Yeah, mm. exactly. Mm. Then the next part of your book is The Love. Yes. And I just wanted to mention that you start all your chapters with a quote. And uh, one of my favorite ones is in this section of the book. And you say, until one has loved an animal, a part of one's soul remains unawakened. And that's Mm. an Anatole France quote. So I love that. It's so true. So as you said earlier, this part of the book discusses grief and how one might experience grief. Um, And you advise the readers to feel their grief and not suppress it, which we mentioned Mm -hmm. before. Um, With your counsellor hat on, how is it beneficial to do that? So by feeling the grief, we're able to process it rather than suppress it. And it's a really heavy and potentially sad energy. So as I mentioned just briefly before, if we repress or suppress any of the those emotions like sadness, anger, grief um, we're also suppressing any good emotions so being a part of a human and our human condition we have this whole array of emotions and we can't pick and choose the ones we want to feel and Mm. the ones we don't so and it's like when you look at the children in the playground one minute they're crying then they're laughing then they're yelling at you then they're just you know um, you know bouncing back between emotions and and obviously it's a little bit different as we get older but it's it's being able just to feel what comes up and um, they can be really overpowering and strong so trying to get to know ourselves better and learn ways that we can um, express them so we're able to find those beautiful rich loving emotions and Mm -hmm. we can walk around the streets you know going oh my god look at that tree how beautiful that is oh life's amazing life's wonderful and I feel that often you know more than 50% of the time way more and I ask people do you feel that like oh my god life's just beautiful they go oh maybe when I'm on holidays but no (laughs) and I kind of get it because I didn't used to either but now I know the difference like there's this whole array of beautiful more than beautiful emotions that make you feel so alive and they're there because I've felt the really bad ones. You've, um, you know, awakened yourself. I'm just open. Yeah, you're open. Whatever mm. arises next, I'm sort of a clearer channel for yeah. anything to come up and when it comes up, I let it out and yoga has helped me a lot with that too. So that leads very nicely to my next question. You talk about walking through the middle of the grief yes so obviously that's related to experiencing those emotions so what do you actually mean by that how does one walk through the middle of the grief yeah it sounds a bit scary doesn't it It sounds like like walking on hot coals and it it kind of is (laughs) it's a bit scorching and hot at that place what it means to me is just if you feel something you let it go like I've been walking through supermarkets with my sunglasses on and tears streaming down my face or yoga classes and tears streaming down my face and just allowing it um, rather than, oh, I can't cry, got to stop, got to stop mm. because I'm here and then you never get back to it. Or And if there's emotions there, maybe you use something to help draw it out like stillness, quiet, music, whatever it may be because otherwise you can feel that energy in your body and your body tightens and, and ten, you know tenses up. So it's just that allowing um, and it can be really scary but just trusting in the experience and if something comes up, letting it out rather than trying to push it back down so that's kind of what I mean by yeah just walking through it just allowing Mm -hmm. those emotions to rise yeah and I can see how that can be scary because as you say maybe crying in the supermarket it's not the in quotes done thing is it so (laughs) so I can see why someone yeah. might want to suppress yeah, of course. those feelings because they can arise at inconvenient times. Yes, and they do. And yeah. then we're busy and we can't get to it or or it's even – and the other thing you can do is, um, is journaling – um, because that can bring up stuff too, is like thinking about or making a note in your phone or something, oh, I need to come back and mm-hmm. think about this that came up today. Um, and, you know, I went water skiing the other weekend and halfway home, <laughs> which I don't advise you do in the car, I, some music came on, I just cried half. <laughs> 30 kilometers home and it's like oh you know I can't really see but I was really crying and 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 I knew it was quite a few different things that were coming up but sometimes it's not even rational rationally trying to work out what it is just let it out yeah yeah because 
sometimes, as you say, you don't know what's triggered that feeling. No. Like presumably you had a fun time water skiing. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and, then, and we get back, we go back into our head and we try mm. and analyse it and work it out rather than staying in the body mm-hmm. and letting the body advise us what it wants to do because the, the emotions are kind of trapped and circling around in the body and we need to get them out. Yeah, okay. So when you're talking about walking straight through the grief, you're basically saying let those emotions happen yeah be with those emotions and don't try and suppress them yeah and then we're we are standing in the center of that grief if we have that big tear fest coming up and and i think of tears as our heart spilling over and i had a friend in yoga yesterday and she started getting teary and she's all apologetic i'm so sorry i'm like no let it out Mm. let it out um you know then we feel lighter we talked about the stages of grief in our previous podcast together But I think that's a really important topic to understand uh, and worth revisiting. And there are two models of grief, the fairly well-known one, the five stages of grief by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and your own formulation in the pink process. So why do you think it's worthwhile knowing about the stages of grief? Yes, it, well, it's very interesting to know about the stages of grief because it's kind of the theory of it and it helps us understand that we're not so alone and what we're experiencing mm. is potentially normal. We can be thrown into more of a complex grief that may not be normal and we may need to seek help. But um, it's also very interesting to learn those stages when we're not in the grief. Sometimes it's good to read about them before. So when we come to the grief, we know what we're going to expect. So, for example, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. And you can bounce back around between them and go in different orders. But to know that, oh, I'm angry. Oh, well, okay, that's a normal part of grief. Yeah. But it depends how you would know within yourself if you're thinking, I I feel out of control or I need to go and get some help from a psychologist or someone someone else. Um, But knowing that it is normal to feel angry. Okay, I'm feeling angry. That's normal. Can I cope with it and deal with it? Yes, I can. Can I not? No, I need to go and ask for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I had one mine, which I call named In the Pink Process, because that's the name of my business, which is similar but different in that creating a self-awareness and then taking responsibility um, for our fear, our grief and then feeling it, um, pro- um, processing any forgiveness, and then we're also we move to that acceptance stage. So mm-hmm. it's similar, but it's just a little bit different. And I went through this exact thing the three times right so um and reading two different takes on it can just maybe help yeah because every as you say everyone's different and they may experience things differently they you may not experience all five stages of grief you may experience three two or whatever so yes it is good to have that framework i think yeah Um, especially for people that haven't experienced grief before because Mm. it is it's a confusing time, isn't it? Yeah, going it's through very grief. confusing mm. the first or even the second as well. It's confusing every time. But if it's your first time, it's like, wow, I don't know where I am or what's going on. And sometimes the ground can feel like it's not even there. Nothing's, mm. Everything's surreal and you've lost your footing or yeah. um, the world's just spinning. Because your whole life has to readjust yeah. around the grief. Yeah. Um, and so the future that you may have imagined will be totally different without this pet person in your life. So one of the very poignant points you make is that um, grief can be very, pet grief can be very difficult for us humans because we're often the ones that have to make the decision Mm -hmm. about putting our pet down or euthanizing our pet. And that can bring with it feelings of guilt So I just wanted to talk about that. How do you know when it's time to say goodbye to your pet, to get them put down? Do do veterinarians normally help with that kind of decision? Yeah, it's a really tough one. And when I worked in the vet industry, I hear that a lot. And yes, they do. The vets and the nurses will generally, especially the vets, will reassure you that the time is right. Um, They will guide you through that process or... Uh, you know give you some options if you're not quite there Mm -hmm. Um, and even with me putting Chelsea down you know 12 weeks ago and with all the experience I have I was still like oh is this the right time I don't know I just had kidney issues but the day that I decided 
I knew 100% it was the right time. Right. So I think sometimes you get a, little, a week, a couple of weeks, a couple of days that you kind of think, do I, don't I, I don't know. And you, you ask people and you ask the vet. And, and then all of a sudden, I think you just know. Right. And if you operate from their point of view rather than our own, um, you know, because it's, it's an act of love the final act of love to say goodbye and take them out of their misery and propel us into our own um, grief and depression over it Mm. is very hard but I think if we really listen to our heart we know but we can get caught in the head again so that's when the vets can help us yes yes well your maxi gave you a a sign didn't he he put his little when he was a puppy he'd always put his paw on my book when I was reading in bed I'm like max I can't see the words (laughs) anyway so the last day I, I asked him for a sign and I was looking at our photo albums and within minutes he lifted his paw and put it on the photo album and he Aww. hadn't done that in years. And I took it off and put it away and then he did it again. I went, oh, you're telling me this is your sign? Oh, beautiful boy. Sorry. <laughs> this See, is a so, sad No, moment. I'm going to let the tears <laughs> flow down my cheeks as we talk about Max. He is beautiful. So can you give our listeners some tips then on how to navigate that guilt that is associated with making the decision to euthanize your pet? I was thinking about this because I thought you might ask me this and I looked up what guilt guilt actually meant, meant in one of the dictionaries and it said culpable or responsible for a specific wrongdoing. Okay. Now I thought that was really interesting because... Bearing in mind that I believe making this decision, as I said, is the final act of love for our pets. We're really Mm. lucky we don't have to put our pets through what our parents or our grandparents, you know, have to deal with, with cancer and the end of their life. I mean, it's just can be really horrible and a loss of dignity. So we're able to give them that final act of love and they can leave with dignity. And we get thrown, as I said, into our grief. So to me, that's not really an act of wrongdoing. It's an act of love. Yeah. So it's maybe changing our perception a little bit about that. And the other problem with guilt sometimes is that the guilt can be a way of us staying in the thoughts rather than going into the emotions. So it's another way for us to stay stuck and not move forward. So if we allow ourselves to come out of that head, go into the heart and feel those emotions, yes, there'll be a whole lot of sadness because we've had to let them go. Mm. But that's when the love will start flowing up again through you and we'll start to let go of that guilt it's a really tough one yes it is a tough one isn't it the next topic i'd like to talk to you about is children and grief because uh, almost two-thirds of australian households have a pet Mm. um, and a lot of those households are families with children 60% of dog owners refer to their pets as part of the family. You said earlier, fur children. And 40% of Australian households include at least one dog. So that means there are a lot of children um, with dogs in their families. And very often, I believe, children have quite strong links or um, ties with their pets. And for many of them, when their pet dies, it it could be the first time they experience that Mm. grief. So how do we guide our children through the pet grieving process? Um, And I love what you said about they have this beautiful link because, you know, you see a child and a dog playing on the floor and it's just such innocence. It's gorgeous. such love and joy. And to lose that is just enormously difficult. And I think children generally can feel their grief as deep as us but it doesn't linger for as long and I kind of wonder if that's maybe because they're just better at expressing what they feel when they feel it so they naturally and organically just process it and move through it quicker than we would Mm -hmm. when we try and suppress it so I think that things to help children is to include them in the decision process and obviously you've got different age groups so you're being the parent need to decide how old the child is and if they can deal with that and possibly the vet appointments and allowing them to say their goodbyes and being honest and concise because it's a little bit confusing saying oh I've sent Fluffy to the farm or um, you know just using the uh, you know 
the words um, Maxie's died and, and, and ex, you know, explaining what that means because it may be their first experience of grief and it's healthy for them to learn about grief um, and experience it by asking questions and being allowed to feel their emotions and possibly then the parents role modeling to the children yeah. that it is okay to cry. Um, so they can um, benefit a lot from that and they can also process their grief very well children in forms of like creative ways Mm -hmm. like drawing doing a memorial a puppet show painting creating a garden space um anything that's really creative that's what children like to do something that you mention in the book is how to say goodbye to your pet like having a memorial or eulogy so perhaps if uh, there are children in the family this could be a really nice way for them to you know process their emotions and and understand what's happened And with Maxie, I decided to have a memorial more because all the children were asking all these questions and because they hadn't experienced a grief before. And it was great for me to have one. And I set up a little altar, had some candles and the urn with the ashes, various other things. And they all came along with poems. Oh, how gorgeous. I said a little eulogy and then they all came up and said a little eulogy. Then we had dinner and some, um, uh, you know, snacks and stuff. And I left the altar there and one of my nieces kept coming up to the altar and sitting down and she's not necessarily religious but putting her hands in the prayer pose and just saying a little thing to Max and then a few tears and she'd leave and she'd come back and they were making all those Numi bracelets are they called oh they're the little elastic bandy yeah. things yeah. and you know they kept putting them all over his collar and, and it was a really good way for them to understand and be part of that goodbye yeah that sounds lovely what a nice send off it was a nice send off mm. yeah yeah So the next part of your book is the lessons and that's where you contemplate what we learn from our pets and what they have taught us. So can you tell us about what some of those lessons might be? Yes, I think that they teach us an enormous (laughs) amount of things, um, especially around unconditional love, giving and receiving. Um, I mean, they just model it all the time and another one that's really big for me is just being in the moment like this morning before I came here you should have seen me I was in my walking clothes covered in golden retriever fur (laughs) because I was hiding my face from the puppy and then going and you know she's on top of me and she's trying to get to me and jumping over the other dog just you know really so and I thought about it at that moment I am so in the present moment here I'm not worried about recording this podcast (laughs) I was in the fairy moment just enjoying it so and you know you can tell by my smile just from through my voice that it was a really special moment so And just, you know, being physically fit and self-loving and having fun and being authentic. There's so many lessons. Yeah. The other thing about animals is they never hold grudges, do they? No. No. Yeah, let it all go. No. Um, So how many dogs do you currently have? I have two, two? a 14-year-old and a one-year-old. And do you walk them together or do you do it separately? I tried to walk them together, but it's a bit of a disaster because they've got different needs. So I walk Pippi the puppy for an hour, come home, give her a little bit of food and then walk the 14 year old for about 20 minutes oh okay I think that's when I saw you this morning I saw (laughs) Lara walking past our house that must have been with the 14 year old uh no with the one year old oh with the one year old oh so the one year old is quite big yes she's big now yeah and then in the afternoon they get another hour together at a park somewhere you're the perfect dog mum they have two hours every day (laughs) oh wow that's great Lara what have been some of the responses that you've had to your book Uh, Yeah, I've had a lot of lovely responses and and everyone kind of says that the first part of the book is really beautiful with, you know, Maxie talking about his um, story. Katrina Warren, you know, she was great endorsing it and she's loved it and put some posts on her page and Talking Stones is a place that I've got a stone, lovely river stone with the name of Maxie and Chelsea and the dates. So, you know, they've taken it on and they, they love it. So they're going to do some promotions with them. Animal Welfare League and RSPCA, they've been really great mm-hmm. in supporting me in the local bookshops. And um, it was funny the other day, someone sent me something and it was in Australian dog lover magazine that i'm like how did they get hold of it they just must have and i sent them an email so we're in contact now and i think they want me to do a podcast as well but i think because it's hot pink it's quite catching 
and I think you know Katrina doing the forward was just beautiful um, because most people or a lot of dog lovers know Katrina Warren quite well so and just the you know the individuals that have read it have you know all said that they've really loved it too so I'm really thrilled because to be perfectly honest I said this at my book launch and I say it as a secret I think it's my favourite of my three books oh, because I love you're not allowed favourite children are you but <laughs> no. I love animals so much yes that's very clear I'll just quickly say Lara had a fabulous book launch for this book um, at a local pub in Adelaide and it was just (laughs) jam-packed and it was gorgeous you spoke so beautifully you had a slideshow and it was just lovely oh thank you yeah Yeah, it was was, a very very special night yeah it was really fun yeah I enjoyed it a big part of healing from grief I think is self-care so in your book you include activities you prompt people to do things that will improve their well-being so Um, An example is writing in a journal. You call it a pink pet grief journal. Yes. And you give people tips to help them start off. So an example would be, was my pet linked to any major life events? What role did my pet play in my life? So it seems that writing a journal is something that features in certainly your two books that I've read. Is it in your first book as well? So in all of your books. So it's... um, clearly a cathartic process I think for you and what is it about keeping a grief journal that helps with the healing do you think uh yeah journals are amazing I've got quite a few of them and I've referred back to them all when I've written my books because they've got all this information from my head and my heart in there so I think it just gets the thoughts out of your head and down onto a piece of paper and sometimes when you free flow write So that kind of means that you don't care about what it looks like, if it's messy or tidy. You just write what's coming out of you straight down onto the piece of paper. Um, Things present that may need to be healed Mm -hmm. or epiphanies that you go, oh my gosh, that's maybe why I do that. And it becomes a really safe space because it kind of unlocks unlocks the emotions and helps you gain more insight into your life. Um, And you can just get things out you know and it's different for everyone but I found a lot of my greatest answers to my greatest life questions by um, journaling in a book and I never thought I was that creative or a writer and yet once I started writing my three books it was almost like I wrote my three books like I was writing a journal right and things just came out you know like I wasn't even thinking I just all of a sudden had 80,000 words in a document in front of me and oh my gosh it's a book (laughs) So do you um, set aside a time each day to journal or do you do it when you feel you need to? I tend to probably more so do it when I need to or although I think it's probably better to do it as a regular Mm -hmm. preventative thing which I have done on occasions as well but definitely when you need to when you're in a state of confusion journaling can be very good as can meditation I think that's another really really top form of yeah finding the answers and I think with meditation and I'm sure this would apply to journaling if you treat it a bit like a discipline Yes. And then it becomes a habit yes. and then you just do it. Yes. That's what I try and do with meditation yes. with varying degrees of success, <laughs> I must say. But on the topic of self-care, it'd be nice to end this chat on a positive note. So, Lara, sure. you're a teacher, a counsellor, you coordinate a sistership circle and so you are very well qualified to talk about self-care. So can you tell us some of your favourite methods of self-care and uh, self-love so yes i i love this um so we need to love ourselves like it's almost like putting that oxygen mask on ourselves before our children in the plane you know if we don't love ourselves we can't pass it on to others and how can we love others people get caught in that with a relationship if we're not loving ourselves you know so my 2021 thing is less do, more be. Mm-hmm. So we're so busy doing, 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 and we're not spending that time being. And I'm a type A personality and I'm a Virgo star sign, which is very organized and all the rest. So it's been a long 20 year learning for me um, but I think yoga and meditation is my top go-to at the moment I teach yoga but 
anything along those lines, even mindfulness, like just being really present in what we're doing. And, you know, you probably hear mindfulness, wash the dishes and, you know, make sure, you know, think about all the suds on your fingers Mm -hmm. and the temperature of the water. But anything that we're doing, just coming back into the present moment and being fully focused when we do it. And it's kind of trying to let go of the past a little plan for the future but don't worry too much and just come back to that present moment and I keep telling myself that and I actually bring my hands into you know like the prayer pose not a religious pose more of a yoga one which is called Anjali Mudra and I put them at my heart and that kind of reminds me to sink back into my heart rather than being to the left in the past or to the right in the present where my hands might be I pull them back to the center and I think also trying to remove ourselves from drama and being around people that you know lift us up and we walk away going oh what a great you know meeting or coffee or I feel really energized and enthused about life again Um, because people have a big play in how we feel you know absolutely and not, I think we try and change people and I think it's accepting people for who they are. And another tip I've learned through the sistership circles is knowing that if we're reacting to something negatively, that person or situation that you think that's created the issue is more likely just a trigger yes. for something going on inside us that we may need to look at. So use it as a message rather than um, trying to more so shoot the messenger and, and, and take the blame outwards because life is really a mirror projecting back to us. So if we can sort of use some of those techniques or theories or um, learn a bit more about that, we come back and we heal more of ourselves. So then we're more self-loving and we can honour ourselves more and um, and then life sort of change, starts to change, you know, like and you know, the normal things like sleeping and eating well and living a life full of purpose, following what you're Mm. passionate about and doing some of that every day. And of course, I think the most important is having a few fur children (laughs) at your feet to trip over. (laughs) Um, Thank you. That was gorgeous. I do love your um, description of putting your hands into the prayer pose to bring you into the current moment, into the present, because I think sometimes having a physical trigger can really help. I'm going to take that And I do that a lot in yoga. I lift my hands up to the sky. I bring them into prayer above my head, and then I bring them down the center line and rest them back at my heart, and that brings me back into the present moment. Mm. Oh, that's gorgeous. Finally, I ask all my guests this same question about if they could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well-being what would they be but obviously Lara's been on this podcast before so I'll just give a brief recap last time you gave us three tips because you're generous you said do yoga and meditation you said it's changed your life and allowed your body to rest and heal the second tip was sleep get enough sleep sleep well And the third is get a dog. So do you have anything to add to those recommendations? Well, I'll just change get a dog to get a dog or a cat or a hamster or a horse. (laughs) Anything that's got like fur or scales or something on it, that that, that is an animal. Um, And I think my new one is do less, be more. Mm, mm. That's a very nice way to approach life. In fact... If there are any silver linings from COVID, I would say that's probably one of them because Mm. we all had to stop for a little while. And certainly I know as a mother with three busy children, you spend so much time driving around, racing around everywhere that you you forget to be. Mm. Since COVID, we've cut back on our activities and I feel like our whole household is a little bit calmer. Oh, that's mm. so lovely. And yeah. I've heard that from a lot of people yeah, so that have I. want to go back into isolation because yeah. <laughs> it was so nice, me included. Yeah. <laughs> no, we've been pretty lucky here, though, I, I must add. We haven't generally, for the lay population, we haven't really felt in danger, have we? No, in mm. Adelaide, we've been very, very mm. lucky. Mm. So, Lara, if someone wants to connect with you or buy your book or see what you're doing, what, what are the best ways to do that? Probably go to my website, lifeinthepink.com.au, mm-hmm. and that shows my Facebook page where you can buy my book, um, come to yoga if you're local, participate in a sistership circle. Yeah, that's probably the easiest place. Excellent. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So thank you very much for sharing all your knowledge with us today, Lara. It was a wonderful 
interview. Oh, thank you so much, Amanda, for having me back for the second time. It's just so lovely to come and talk to your audience. Well, I think you need to write another book so you can come back again. <laughs> I'll come back again. I need a, few, a new topic. Thank I may you. have one brewing. <laughs> and that was the very warm and wise Lara Casanova talking to us about healing from pet loss and grief and also about her latest book dealing with that topic called Loss, Love and Lessons. Lara has kindly left me with a signed copy of her book to give away to one of my lucky listeners. If you would like to read Loss, Love and Lessons, Healing Pet Loss and Grief, please email me at contact at wellbeingpodcast.com and I'll send the book to the listener who writes in first. Thank you so much for listening today and I do hope that you found my chat with Lara helpful, especially if you're someone who has lost a pet. If you are enjoying Vibrant Lives podcast, please share it and tell your friends about it. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcast, it will help people find my podcast. If you would like to subscribe to my podcast, you can subscribe on all good podcast providers like Apple Podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio and Google Podcasts. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Please follow me on Instagram and Facebook and check out my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com where you can contact me via the contacts page. Producing the podcast is a labour of love. It's become my full-time job and I do dedicate a lot of time, money and effort towards it. If you enjoy my podcast and would like to support it, I would be so grateful. There are a few ways you can do that. You can go to the donate page on my website and you can make a donation via PayPal or you can buy a book from the book reviews page on my website. If you click on the Amazon link in my bookshop, at no extra cost to you, I receive a small commission when you buy the book. Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.